Okay, in this session, actually, we will talk about high-performance apparel. And uh, the first speaker is Ms. Janice Wen from the Avion Hong Kong Limited. She is the CEO of Avion. And uh, probably high-performance apparel is uh, the rapidly growing areas in textile and apparel. So uh, let's see uh, what Janice is going to share with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, it's been a really interesting day, and I and I, I learned a lot from the past uh, three speakers and what they're working on. Um, today, I kind of want to talk a little bit about disruption and innovation in high-performance apparel. Um, I want to start with the stories of the three largest sportswear companies, because I think it, we need to put this in context. And the context has to be to how to illuminate how a small idea can make a huge impact. So we're going to talk about Adidas, Nike, and Under Armour. Full disclosure, all of these are our clients. And I had to stack, I had to sign a stack of NDA documents about this large. So everything that you see today is in the public domain. This was one of Adi Dassler's first shoes. It's a spike shoe. I think we've all seen a spike shoe. The top is made of kangaroo leather, and the bottom are steel spikes. Between the mid-1920s and mid-1950s, Adi Dassler refined his sprint shoe to help athletes break records. And thus, Adidas was born. But what actually did he do that revolutionized quite a lot of what we know Adidas today? It's this. He took the same concept and brought it to a football arena where he decided to screw studs into the football boot. And in 1954, West Germany squad all wore this special cleat made by Dassler. They later said that they won over Hungary. They beat them three to two because of this shoe. So, after, um, after that, Dassler had the idea of creating nylon soles for his sports shoes, and this was just one of the many technological advances that he would make over the next few decades. These ideas all came about because he tinkered inside a manufacturing facility. He made things with other people. Bill Bowerman. Anybody know who Bill Bowerman is? He's the co-founder of Nike. He was also the sports coach um, of the Oregon Ducks. Um, and so Bill Bowerman always innovated to make his athletes number one. And I can't find an image of this because it was from the 1950s, okay? Um, they were actually having a race. And um, he, wanted, he said that every slightest advantage might make his athletes win. So what did he do? He dressed them in yellow and bright yellow t-shirts and a bright ye green pair of shorts. And he said, if my athlete can just inch his chest across that line, I want the judge to actually see him inch his chest across that line. Um, today, we have sensors for all those kinds of things. But guess what? These things were innovations at the time. Um, he would also say that, in another example, he would make his athletes train in white cotton long underwear. Because in Oregon, it rains a lot. And what they used to do was they used to wear sweatpants. And if you have sweatpants, it soaks up a lot of water if you're running in the rain. So as a result, um, the Oregon uh, local residents, because this was the 1950s, said, oh, it's indecent. We, we can't have that. So what does Bill Barrowman do at that point? He dyes the underwear green. So all you get all these runners running around in, in Oregon with green legs. But it made them run faster. So one of the biggest things that Bill Bowerman is known for is about taking apart an existing Adidas shoe. He takes apart the Adidas shoe because the best shoes are made in Germany. And he says, I'm going to take out the spikes. They're too heavy. 
um, I'm going to add rubber to the bottom. And thus is the waffle iron that he took from his kitchen. And he poured, instead of pancake batter into it, he poured urethane. And by pouring urethane into it, he created the Cortez shoe. Then he took that bottom upper and he split it around and he said, well, actually, I want to make these kinds of ridges because it's going to grip the ground harder. And thus, Nike was born. So the question then becomes, how does Bill Bowerman find out all of these things? He has a spark of genius. He doesn't do it alone. He had to do it together with a local cobbler, a Springfield boot maker, a Japanese shoe factory, which for all of you shoe heads out there, sneaker heads out there, it's Onitsuku Taiga. They were the one who actually made Nike Nike. And they had athletes providing the feedback loop. The feedback loop was one of the most important things that made Nike Nike. So. Under Armour. Kevin Plank in 1995, in his grandmother's basement. Okay? Kevin Plank's story of Under Armour will all start with one t-shirt. In 1995, Kevin Plank was not the greatest football player of them all, but he was the sweatiest. He sweat through all of the clothes that he wore underneath his football um, um, outfit. And what then he did was he strove to make an undershirt that would wick away moisture and yet keep athletes cool. So he goes to the New York Garment District and he looks for women's underwear and he finds this anti-wicking thing. And, and albeit, this is 1995, right? So we already had this kind of technology. Um, and he launches his first prototypes at the University of Maryland. He goes out, he enlists players to find out all of their pain points. And today, Under Armour is dominating every single sport that they go into. Kevin Plank does not do this alone either. He has a mother who supports him and makes him his dinner while he's you know, starting his, his, his um, startup in his grandmother's basement. He has his athletic football teammates, you know, who all support him. And he has Kip Fultz, and Kip Fultz is his COO, and um, he was a lacrosse player. The other thing that he had is that Kevin Plank had Hollywood. Hollywood made, Oliver Stone said, I'm going to make any given Sunday. And he, Kevin Plank ships a whole bunch of these undershirts and says, I hope that they really like it. So the costume designer really likes it. And he makes it. And in that day, they made $800,000 worth of, in that week, they made $800,000 worth of orders, going from 17,000 in one year, um, and the next week it was 800,000. So, now that we know the basis of whole, how all of these kind of sports companies started, I wanna talk about where they're going. And if you look at all the vision statements of these companies, Nike, serve the athlete. Adidas, no athlete left behind. Under Armour, make all athletes better. The, everything is centered around the athlete. The question has now become, who is the athlete? And hopefully this will play. Okay, this is Adidas. I'm just going to talk over this. This is a climate chill um, advert. I think that most people would say, and all these sports companies would say, if you have a body, you are an athlete. These kids running to play whatever sport that they want to and strive to be the best that they do. These are not weekend warriors. They want to be sports players. something from this, the market that you're now working for is so expanded that Nike's become a $30 billion company, 
Adidas has become a $17 billion company, and the most incredible growth spurt of them all is obviously Under Armour, going from 17,000 US dollars in 1995 to $4 billion today. And this is kind of interesting because there's a lot of pressure on the market now. The increase in demand for performance sport apparel and footwear has resulted in this increasingly long and complex global supply chain, which in turn has created a lot of challenges for the industry. If we look at this map above, right, we're going to say every region in which we source from has issues, conflict, limitations in resource, poverty, and in essence, in the past 20 years, we've gone to a supply chain that has focused on the price of labor. Um, and we went, to, we went to lower and lower cost production. And some without the infrastructure or the technology that is required to, to, to make for a world that we live in today. So we need to look a little bit about disrupting the whole way that we actually make product. The innovation is, still going, is going to be how we can still source sustainably transparently and quickly. And quickly is the key one here. Consumers not only expect it, they demand it. I think Amazon Prime really did our heads in because you know, when, with the advent of one day shipping, we, they created this expectation that we should have what we have today. It's not particularly sustainable. Nike's made some intros into this. It's about producing sustainably. They can tell you, or so they say, where your goods are made, when they made it, and who made it. Yeah, okay. In industry, we'll all say, eh. So, I want to talk about what McKinsey has to say about this, because it's, it's a little bit of a different uh, module. McKinsey defines next sourcing as sourcing production in close proximity to both innovation and the customer. Today, one of the most significant disruptions is actually moving manufacturing closer to home and closer to innovative technologies and doing it all together. So I want to talk about two smaller companies, sorry, that actually are kind of interesting. Boathouse Sports is a local Philadelphia company that makes uniforms for team sports. Okay, if you have a baseball league of junior league uh, baseball players, you can make um, a uniform set of seven uh, at Boathouse Sports. Um, it's a very small company, and yet it was chosen to make the US rowing team's Olympic outfit. And it's because it had some ideas about innovation. It worked with the textile engineers at Philadelphia University to create custom fit, custom knitted rowing uniforms, and antimicrobial protection. And if we saw what we saw in Rio, you needed the antimicrobial protection. Um, nobody got sick, which was a great thing. This is Hong Kong Rita's. Um, it's very much closer to home, and you can see it next door. Um, so Hong Kong Rita worked with rowers. They scanned them, and in turn made better uniforms that had fewer seams, and were better adept to keeping them cool. You know, what these two ex smaller examples show are that you need collaborations, you know, interdisciplinary things. And I think all of the previous speakers also talked about that. Um, Remember the way that the giants started their business? This is the same thing. You know, you have collaboration. And it, it, in turn, it creates, it fosters something very different. Of course, it's kind of easier to do this when you're only talking about a small team of rowers. And so I think one of the big things that has the biggest impact is how uh, the giants actually are going to change their supply chain. Nike's innovation 2016 event in New York, Mark Parker says, we're at um, an era of personalized performance. We're gonna customize everything for anybody who wants it, basically. Now, we're going from unit of 10,000, unit of one. You look into Nike's movement into the order of one, and you think, well, how do you actually do that, right? You need some state-of-the-art machinery but you also need state-of-the-art people, okay? Does anyone here remember the fuel band? It's this thing that's on my arm. It launched in 2012 to Nike, right? Um, Nike, that was my first foray into being a wannabe athlete. Um, a Nike made me a new mom who want, didn't really want to go running. 
just do it. And this is uh, the reason why I'm mentioning the fuel ban is because it was made by a company called Flextronics. And I, I, I assume that most of you've heard of Flextronics. Flextronics today is known as Flex. S Nike last year announced that they were doing a collaboration partnership with Flex. Flex is an electronics, consumer electronics maker. What has it got to do with Nike? Nike decides to partner with them because Eric Spunk says, we decided that we wanted to go outside our industry because frankly, we work with the best in class footwear manufacturers in the world. But we felt we needed an accelerant or a catalyst to make us think differently as an industry. Leveraging laser cutting is just one of the ways that Flex is rethinking footwear. It took Flex six months to figure out a better way of cutting a soft, laser cutting a soft material. Nike had been using that and said that they couldn't do it for 20 years. So they only could cut onto a hard surface material. Um, in, May of, in May 2016, so a couple months ago, sorry, Flex's Consumer Technologies Group President Michael Fanagan says, in 2016, there were 25 million smart athletic garments made. In 2015, there were 100,000. It is significant. In the last 18 months, Flex have built 20 inventions on the fa factory floor alone, created the fastest factory launch, including automation and new technologies. In 150 days, they went from auto factory ramp to factory ship. So they shipped their first product in 150 days. That's pretty damn fast for a, you know, a, a, a footwear manufacturer who's never been a footwear manufacturer before. Nike's also working on transforming its trans, uh, traditional manufacturing. It entered into a partnership with private equity giant Apollo Asset Management. Um, Apollo has already purchased uh, a factory in New Holland, Pennsylvania, and two old factories in North Carolina. They intend to strip out and transform them with state-of-the-art equipment and robotics, and Nike is committed to giving orders for product that will be produced in the market in which it will sell. So before we went all the way from America to Asia to produce, and now we're going all the way back. What does that really mean for, the world, for both the third world, uh, well, not the third world, both our economies out here um, in developing countries, and what does that mean for developed countries? It's not only Nike that's been working on this. Um, Adidas is too. It's going to do speed factory. Um, Adidas is looking at what they call a, 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 compri a, a minimal employment, 150 people with lots of robots, and they're going to make half a million pairs of shoes. Um, it's going to be quite interesting. And not to be outdone on the open source part, you know, because Adidas is all about collaboration. Um, they have Game Plan A. Now, Game Plan A, a is really interesting because Game Plan A is this idea of um, a philosophy of innovation. Bring everybody together, and you might actually have something that sticks. Um, Adidas says, it's quite simple. Turn over the tools to work with. Open free spaces for collaboration. And bring in new perspectives from everyone. And you'll almost automatically get different results. So it's, it's something for leaders to think about. And this brings us to Under Armour. <laughs> Under Armour, the country, a company that surged past Adidas in the US is not to be, you know, they're going to fight. Kevin Plank wants to be number one. He wants to be number one. Kevin Plank has bet almost a billion dollars that Under Armour will beat Nike. So what does he do? Takes a billion bucks, and he goes and buys a bunch of technology companies. He bought MapMyRun, MapMyFitness. Um, my Fitness Pal and Endomodo. Spent a, a billion dollars doing that. But what he really did was he spent it on the people. He brought all these companies for the great minds and he made sure that those CEOs and he wooed them to stay with him. Um, this basically will mean that Under Armour will have a very data centric view of the Under Armour consumer. Under Armour knows when you have run 3.1 miles, okay? They know if you run in the rain. They know when you want a new pair of shoes. 
and they're going to sell you that pair of shoes. Um, it's, Under Armour is also going to know whether you're healthy or not. And so they launched health blocks. Who knows? This could be the MySpace of fitness apps, right? It could be obsolete by tomorrow. But he's betting on something that will be. On June on the 28th, Under Armour opens a state-of-the-art high-tech manufacturing facility in downtown Baltimore. Under Armour's making plans that are really something else. So I want to read you something that I, I got in the Baltimore Sun two days ago. Um, silently, very quietly over the past 10 years, Kevin Plank has been buying up Port Covington in Baltimore. And he says, and I quote, I believe that we find ourselves at another fork in the road. There are many great large and small businesses in our city, as well as landmark institutions that have a huge impact. It is a fact, however, that today, there is no Fortune 500 company that calls Baltimore home. While companies can really help cities, having just any large company here would not make a change for the better. His own vision is for Port Covington is that it is a vision for investment opportunity and a making of American history. He goes on to say, we cannot wait. We can't wait. I mean this both in the sense that I, we are incredibly excited to build something special in Baltimore. And for you, those of you who've never been to Baltimore, Baltimore is like the drug capital of the world. You have all watched The Wire, right? It also makes whiskey. So it's two things, drugs and whiskey. And Under Armour, number three, okay? It kind of doesn't really sit well together. But he's going to invest in this city. And it's, and it's a very interesting place for him to do it, right? So I want to show you what's inside the Lighthouse Project. This all came from the Baltimore Sun. I'm not showing you anything that you don't know. See those classified things there? That's ours. Very happy about that. But of course, it's classified because you can't, because they keep their secrets to themselves. What they've basically done is they've got the best 3D MD scanner in order to capture morphology. They've got Lectra spreading and cutting systems. They've got Bemis injection molding. They've got Dem Desmos robotics, and then of course us, right? All of our mannequins are in there. There will be a hundred employees to begin with. Some of them are from Under Armour. Some of them are from the technology companies that are allowed inside this, this, this kind of laboratory that they're making. And Kevin Plank says to the media at that point, my hope is that you come here next year and it will not be here. It will all be obsolete and new things will be in its place because we will continually innovate. That's a very short time span, one year. I think we don't think in the kind of pace that that some of these leaders are thinking about. So I kind of want to end with uh, one short story. Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour all point to one thing. They're all getting the best minds to work on the most complicated problems. There is a woman named Amanda Parks, who is the chief technologist at Manufacture New York. And she's also a textile um, expert. What we, and I'm just going to paraphrase what she says. What we forgot about is the process of making things. Fashion companies have a particular expertise around feel and fit and how they want the product to perform. Technologists don't understand how the process of making textiles. There is a massive gap, but it also can be bridged. She tells that, then she goes on to tell the story of a PhD lab that makes a battery technology inside a fiber. They made three meters of it inside their lab, and they couldn't industrialize it. So she takes the PhD students and the group from Intel, and, they've, and she brings them down to Shimaseki. And none of these guys have seen a Shimaseki knitting machine before. Okay? And she gets the Shimaseki me mechanical engineers to figure out whether we can even knit this thing inside the machine and whether it's going to actually break the machine. And they managed to knit the battery technology into a textile. What I'm trying to say with all of this is that um, it takes different people, it takes different skill sets, and it takes very different contexts to create a future. Um, the disruption is actually not in the technology. The disruption is in the collaboration of lots of people 
from different fields and leaders who allow it to happen and give them the physical space in which it to happen. And that's why hubs work. So I'd like you to think about that. Thank you.